He's creepy and he's sleepy. He's dreaming and he's peepy. All right, I took way too long trying to edit an emote. Then I added them, but the plan here is I got you are first. Also, chat's just right above my face, bro. Where is that even? How? Why are you right there? Why are you there? Let me move you. Wait, can I make you long? Can I make a long chat? Whatever the case, I have this here, uh, Indiana. You know what? I might flip it because you can't read that backwards. Long chat. Indiana Crime Review 2014. It's a, a um, collection of various stories all sitting around crime. I was going to read it first, but because of how I'm going to edit this later, I will read that last. I have a couple other ones to go. But it's pretty it's pretty raunchy. There's going to be some curse words and some um you know, you know that you know that that good good. It's going to be some of that in there. But I'll probably just get right into it. How's everybody else day going? The spice, there's a dog in the room. You can probably hear her flap her ears. It's got the spice. It's dirty. I got one I've never read. That book I read like a long, long time ago. I got a bunch of other ones. I'm here to listen and be a nuisance. That's the spirit. We'll find out if I turned all the sound alerts off or not soon enough. I think I left one. But I'm just going to get right into these bad boys. The Evil Clergyman Hello. by H.P. Lovecraft. Hello. I was shown into the attic chamber by a grave, intelligent-looking man with quiet clothes and an iron-gray beard who spoke it's to me in this fashion. It's time to bust with horror. <laughs> yes, it is. Who spoke to me in this fashion. The horror bust. No. There we go. Yes. He lived here, but I don't advise you doing anything. Your curiosity makes you irresponsible. We never come here at night, and it's only because of his will that we keep it this way. You know what he did. That abominable society took charge at last, and we don't know where he is buried. But there is no way the law or anything else could reach the society. I hope you won't stay till after dark. And I beg of you to let that thing on the table, that thing that looks like a matchbox, alone. We don't know what it is, but we suspect it has something to do with what he did. We even avoid looking at it very steadily. Oh yeah, nothing like that. Just a good old a matchbox shaped thing. <laughs> you ever seen that cursed matchbox? Where you don't, you're not supposed to look at it. If you touch it, it'll, uh, it'll burn the whole place down. No, it won't. You have to do it. <laughs> After a time, the man left me alone in the attic room. It was very dingy and dusty, and only primitively furnished. Yeah, fresh from Ikea. But it had a neatness which shewed it was not a slum denizen's quarters. There were shelves full of theological and classical books, and another bookcase containing treatises of magic. Paracelsus, Albert Magnus, Trithymius, Hermes Trismegidus, Bore I love these. I love uh, reading names that uh, nobody's named anymore. They used to have cool names, I think. Uh, Borlas and others in strange alphabets whose titles I could not decipher. The furniture was very plain. It was just a. It was a mattress and a television. He was a single. He was a single man. There was a door, but it only led into a closet. The only egress was the aperture in the floor, up to which, up to which the crude steep staircase led. The windows were bullseye pattern. Ooh. Bullseye pattern. Oh, there we are. The black oak beams bespoke unbelievable antiquity. Antiquity. Plainly, this house was of the old world. It's old as shit, dude. I seem to know where I was, but cannot recall what I then knew. Certainly, the town was not London. My impression is of a small seaport. Mm. Newports. 
A small object of the table fascinated me intensely. I seemed to know what to do with it, for I drew a pocket electric light, or what looked like one, out of my pocket, nervously tested its flashes. The light was not wide, but violet. Was not white, but violet. And seemed less like true light than some radioactive board bombardment. Oh, we're getting down there. I recalled that I did not regard it as a common flashlight. Indeed, I had a common flashlight in another pocket. I don't know if that's like like a euphemism for something. <laughs> like, you're a common flashlight? It was getting dark, and the ancient roofs and chimney pots outside looked very queer through the bullseye window panes. Hold on, I want to elaborate what a bullseye window is. I don't, I don't think... Bullseye window, is that just a round window? One of these little bad boys. This one's break. I thought there's another one that has like a weird like defect in the middle of it. But, I'm assuming that's what he meant. I got one of those in... Actually, good. Not just one in the house. I was gonna say, like, I wanna say there's like two, but there's just one. And it's, uh, it's covered in dust and spiderwebs because it's not an inconvenient spot to clean. Which is always interesting with windows are like that. I guess for, uh, aesthetic sake, it's okay. Because, like, it lets light in. But, in terms of actually being useful, you can't look out a window that's 15 feet above everyone, right? <laughs> like, that's just not an option. But, anyway... Finally, I summoned up courage and propped the small object up on the table against a book, then turned the rays of the peculiar violet light upon it. The light seemed now to be more like a rain or hail of small violet particles than like a continuous beam. As the particles struck the glassy surface at the center of the strange device, they seemed to produce a crackling noise, like the sputtering of a vacuum tube, through which sparks are passed. The dark glassy surface displayed a pinkish glow, and a vague white shape seemed to be taking form at its center. Then I noticed that I was not alone in the room, and put the ray projector back into my pocket. But the newcomer did not speak, nor did I hear any sound whatever during all the immediate, immediately following moments. Everything was shadowy, pantomime, as if, to see, as if seen at a vast distance through some intervening haze. Although, on the other hand, the newcomer and all subsequent comers oh, loomed large and close, as if both near and distance, according to some abnormal geometry. The newcomer was thin. I'm sorry. The newcomer was a, was a thin, dark man of medium height, attired in the ser clerical garb of the Anglican, Anglican, oh, oh, I'm getting bullied right now, Anglican Church. He was apparently about 30 years old with a sallow olive complexion and a fairly good features, but an abnormally high forehead. Damn, we got her roasting the five headeds. His black hair was well cut and neatly brushed, and he was clean shaven, though blue chinned, with a heavy growth of beard. He wore rimless spectacles with steel bows. His build and lower facial features were like other clergymen I had seen, but he had a vastly higher forehead and was darker and more intelligent looking. All right, we brought up the forehead twice. Really going to go on on this dude's head right now? Also, more subtle and concealed... <laughs> okay, I like that. More subtly and conce concealedly evil-looking. At the present moment, having just lighted a faint oil lamp, he looked nervous, and before I knew it, he was casting all his magical books into a fireplace on the window side of the room, where the wall slanted sharply, which I had not noticed before. The flames devoured the volumes greedily, leaping up in strange colors and emitting indescribable, hideous odors as the strangely hieroglyphic leaves and wormy binds succumbed to the devastating element. All at once, I saw there were others in the room, grave-looking men in clerical costume, one of whom were the bands of knee-breeches of a bishop. Though I could hear nothing, I could see what they were bringing, a decision of vast important, import, to the first comer. They seemed to hate and fear him at the same time, and he seemed to return these sentiments. His face set itself into a grim expression, but I could see his right hand shaking as he tried to grip the back of the chair. The bishop pointed to the empty case into the fireplace where the flames had died down amidst charred, non-committal mass, and seemed filled with a peculiar loathing. The first corner then gave a wry smile. 
and reached out with his he le left hand towards the small object. I hate this phrase, first comer. That's like really breaking my brain right now. The small object on the table. Everyone had seemed frightened. The procession of clerics began filing down the steep stairs, the trap door in the floor, turning and making menacing gestures as they left. The bishop was last to go. That's the wrong button. Uh, what did I... <laughs> God, that's, the, that's not what I wanted. The first comer now went to the cupboard on the inner side of the room and extracted a coil of rope. Mounting a chair, he attached one end of the rope to a hook in the great exposed central beam of the black oak and began making a noose with the other end. Realizing he was about to hang himself, I started forward to dissuade or save him. He saw me and ceased his preparations, looking at me with this kind of triumph with puzzled and disturbed, which dis puzzled and disturbed me. He slowly stepped down from the chair and began gliding toward me with a positively wolfish grin on his dark, thin-lipped face. I felt somehow in a deadly peril and drew out the peculiar ray projector as a weapon of defense. Why I thought it could help me, I did not know. I turned it on, full in his face, and saw the sallow features glow first with violet and then with pinkish light. His expression of wolfish exhalation began to be crowded by side by a look of profound fear. This kind of makes me think of the, the lights from uh, Dying Light when you use the UV lights on the, what do they call them, the super zombies? It's probably not super zombies, it's probably something else. The vo vo volatiles? 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 Yeah, I think it's volatiles which did not, however, wholly displace the exhalation. He stopped in his tracks, then failing, flailing his arms wildly in the air, began to stagger backward. I saw he was edging toward the open stairwell on the floor and tried to shout a warning, but he did not hear me. In another instance, he had lurched backwards to the opening and was lost to view. I found difficulty in moving towards the stairwell, but when I did get there, I found no crushed body on the floor below, Instead, there was a clatter of people coming up the, with lanterns, for the spell of phantasmal silence had broken, and I once more heard sounds and saw figures as normally tridimensional. Something had evidently drawn a crowd to this place. Had there been a noise I had not heard? Presently, the two people, simple villagers apparently, furthest in the lead saw me, and stood paralyzed. One of them shrieked loudly and reverberantly. Arg! It be Zezer! Again! Then they all turned and fled frantically. All that is but one. When the crowd was gone, I saw the grave, grave bearded man who had brought me to this place, standing alone with a lantern. He was gazing at me, grasping and fantastically. I'm fascinated, but did not seem afraid. Then he began to ascend the stairs and join me in the attic he spoke. So you didn't let it alone. I'm sorry. I know how that, what has happened. It happened once before, but the man got frightened and shot himself. You ought to have not made him come back. You know what he wants, but you mustn't get frightened like the other man got. Something very strange and terrible has happened to you, but it didn't get far enough to hurt your mind and personality. If you'll keep cool and accept the need for making certain radical readjustments in your life, you can keep right on enjoying the world and the fruits of your scholarship, but you can't live here. And I don't think you'll wish to go back to London. I'd advise America. You mustn't try anything more with that th thing. Nothing can be put back now. It would only make matters worse to do or summon anything. You're not as badly off as you might be, but you must get out of here at once and stay away. You better thank heaven they didn't go further. Okay, I just want to like make sure I'm understanding this correctly. This guy's staying in, like, a creepy attic thing, and then a ghost tries to, like, hang itself in front of him. I'm assuming it's, like, uh, some Beetlejuice type thing where they're trying to, you know, sp spook you out of not wanting to live in this new house in Nebraska or whatever the hell. <laughs> but you can just watch the ghost try to hang itself and then disappear in that order. What an experience. And then this guy's like, just leave, leave, uh, leave Europe. Oh, are we? I'm going to prepare you as bluntly as I can. There's been a certain change in your personal appearance. He always causes that, but in a new country, you can get used to it. 
There's a mirror up on the other end of the room, and I'm going to take you to it. You'll get a shock, though you will see nothing repulsive. I was now shaking with dead, a deadly fear, and the bearded man almost had to hold me up as he walked me across the room to the mirror. The faint lamp. The formerly on the table, not the still fainter lantern he had brought. In his free hand, this is what I saw in the glass. A thin, dark man of medium stature, attired in the clerical garb of the Anglican Church, apparently about thirty, and with rimless, steel-bowed glasses glistening beneath a sallow olive forehead of an abnormal height. It was the silent first comer who had burned his books. For all the rest of my life, in the outward form, I was to be that man. All right, so we're leaving H.P. Lovecraft, and we're going to the magical world of Robert E. Howard. The fearsome touch of death. Which, um, you know, you've heard that. You know, death, he'd be touching. He'd be like, <laughs> and then, like, fucking, wah, and, uh, is the side effect of that. This would be something like that, for sure. I need more warm water. The fearsome touch of death, Robert E. Howard. As long as midnight cloaks the earth with shadows grim and stark, God save us from the Judas kiss of a dead man in the dark. I'm starting off with a little poetry there. Old Adam Farrell lay dead in the house wherein he had lived alone for the last 20 years. A silent, churlish recluse in his life, he had known no known friends, and only two men had watched his passing. Dr. Stein rose and glanced out the window into the gathering dusk. You think you can spend the night here then? No, I need to give him a different one. You think you can spend the night here then? He asked his companion. This man, Falred by name, assented. Yes, certainly. I guess it's up to me. Rather useless and primitive custom sitting up with the dead, commented the doctor, preparing to depart. But I suppose a common decency, we will have to bow to precedence. Maybe I can find someone who will come over here and help you with your vigil. Falred shrugged his shoulders. I doubt it. Farrell wasn't liked, wasn't known by many people. I scarcely knew him myself, but I don't mind sitting up with the corpse. Dr. Stein was removing his rubber gloves, and Falred watched the process with an interest that almost amounted to fascination. A slight involuntary shudder shook him at the memory of touching those gloves. Slick. Cold. Clammy things. Like the touch of death. You might get lonely tonight if you don't find anyone, the doctor remarked as he opened the door. Not superstitious, are you? Falred laughed. <laughs> Scarcely. Uh, to tell the truth, from what I hear, the Farrell's disposition, Farrell's disposition, I'd rather be watching this corpse than have been his guest in life. The door closed, and Falred took up his vigil. He seated himself in the only chair in the room. Oh, yes. The, uh, even the, when you live alone, you should have a cock chair in your bedroom. The room boasted, and glanced casually at the formless, sheeted bulk of the bed up opposite of him, and began to read by the light of the dim lamp which stood on the rough table. Outside, the darkness gathered swiftly, and finally, Falred laid down his magazine to rest his eyes. He looked against... He looked again at the shape of which had, had in life, been the form of Adam Furl, wondering what quirk in the human nature made the sight of a corpse not only so unpleasant, but such an object of fear to many. Unthinking ignorance, seeing in dead things a reminder of death to come, he decided lazily, and began idly contemplating as to what life had held for this grim and crabbed old man who had neither relatives nor friends, and who had seldom left the house wherein he had died. The usual tales of miser-hoarded miser wealth had accumulated, but Falred felt so little interest in the whole matter that it was not even necessary for him to overcome any temptation to pry about the house for possible hidden treasure. He returned to reading with the shrug. The task was more boresome than he had thought for, after a while, he was aware that every time he looked up from his magazine and his eyes fell upon the bed with its grim occupant, he started 
involuntarily, as if he had, for an instant, forgotten the presence of the dead man and was unpleasantly reminded of the fact. The start was slight and instinctive, but he felt almost angered at himself. He realized for the first time the utter, utter and deadening silence which enwrapped the house, a silence apparently shared by the night, for no sound came through the window. Adam Farrell had lived as far apart from his neighbors as possible, and there was no other house within hearing distance. Falred shook himself as if to rid his mind of unsavory speculations and went back to his reading. A sudden vagrant gust of wind whipped through the window, in which the light in the lamp flickered and went out suddenly. Falred, cursing softly, groped in the shed, shed, fuck, god damn it, groped in the darkness for matches, burning his fingers on the hot lamp chimney. He struck a match, relighted the lamp, and glancing over the bed, got a horrible mental jolt. Adam Farrell's face stared blindly at him, the dead eyes wide and blank, framed in the gnarled gray features. Even as Falred instinctively shuddered, his reason explained the apparent phenomena. The sheet that covered the corpse had been carelessly thrown across the face, and the sudden puff of wind had disarranged and flung it aside. Yet, there was something grisly about the thing. Something... fearsomely suggestive. As if in the cloaking dark, a dead hand had flung aside the sheet, just as if the corpse was about to rise. Fallred, an imaginative man, shrugged his shoulders at the ghastly thoughts and crossed the room to replace the sheet. The dead eyes seemed to stare at him malevolently. With an eye that word just beats the shit out of me every time I have to read it. Mel- Valently, malevolent, malevolent, malevolently, with an evilness that transcended the dead man's churlessness in life, the workings of a vivid imagination, Falred knew, and he recovered the gray face, shrinking as his hand chanced to touch the cold flesh, slick and clammy, the touch of death. He shuddered with the natural avulsion of the living for the dead, and went back to his chair and magazine. At last, Growing sleepy, he lay down upon a couch which, by some strange whim of the original owner, formed part of the room's scant furnishings, he has a cut couch too, and composed himself for slumber. He decided to leave the light burning, telling himself that it was in accordance with the usual custom of leaving lights burning for the dead, for he was not willing to admit to himself that he was al that already he was conscious of a dislike for lying in the darkness with a corpse. He dozed. Awoke with a start and looked at the sheet from the form of the bed. Silence reigned over the house, and outside it was very dark. The hour was approaching midnight. With its accompanying eerie domination over the human mind, Falred glanced again at the bed where the body lay and found the side of the sheet object most repellent. A fantastic idea had birthed in his mind and grew. That, beneath the sheet, the mere lifeless body had become a strange, monstrous thing, a hideous, conscious being that watched him with eyes which burned through the fabric of cloth. This thought, a mere fantasy, of course, he explained to himself by the legends of vampires, undead, ghosts, and such like, the fearsome attributes with which the living had cloaked the dead for countless ages. Since primitive man first recognized in death something horrid and apart from life, Man feared death, thought Falred, and some of his fear of death took hold on the dead so that they, too, were feared, and the sight of the dead engendered grisly thoughts gave rise to dim fears of hereditary memory lurking back in the dark corners of the brain. At any rate, that silent hidden thing was getting on his nerves. He thought of uncovering the face on the principle the familiarity breeds contempt, the sight of the features, calm still in death, would banish, he thought, all such wild conjectures as were haunting him in spite of himself. But the thought of those dead eyes staring in the lamplights was intolerable. So, at last, he blew out the light and lay down. His fear had been stealing upon him so insidiously, and gradually that he had not been aware of its growth. With the extinguishing of the light, however, and the blotting out of the side of the corpse, things assumed their true character proportions, and Falred fell asleep almost 
instantly. On his lips, a faint smile for his previous folly. He awakened suddenly. Hmm. How long he had been asleep, he did not know. He sat up, his pulse pounding frantically, the cold sweat beating his forehead. I wonder if he had an abnormally large forehead. He knew instantly where he was, remembering, remembered the other occupant of the room. But what had awakened him? A dream? Yes. Now he remembered a hideous dream in which the dead man had risen from the bed and stalked stiffly across the room with his eyes of fire and a horrid leer frozen on his gray lips. Fallred had seemed to lie motionless, helpless, and then as the corpse reached a gnarled and horrible hand, he had awakened. He strove to pierce the gloom, but the room was all blackness and all without, all without was so dark that no gleam of light came through the window. He reached a shaking hand toward the lamp, then recoiled as if, recoils as if from a hidden serpent. Sitting there here in the dark with a fiendish corpse was bad enough, but he dared not light the lamp, for fear that his reason would be snuffed out like a candle at what he might see. Horror, stark and unreasoning, had full possession of his soul. He no longer questioned the instinctive fears that rose in him. All those legends he had heard come back, came back to him and brought a belief in them. Death was a hideous thing, a brain-shattering horror, imbuing lifeless men with a horrid malevolence. Adam Farrell in his life had been a simple, churlish, but harmless man. Now he was a terror, a monster, a fiend lurking in the shadows of fear, ready to leap on mankind with talons dipped deep in death and insanity. Falred sat there, his blood freezing, and fought out his silent battle. Faint glimmerings of reason had begun to touch his fright when a soft, stealthy sound again froze him. He did not recognize it as the whisper of the night wind across the windowsill. His frenzied face, I'm sorry, his frenzied fancy knew all it only as the tread of death and horror. He sprang from the couch and then stood undecidedly. Undecided. Escape was in his mind, but he was too dazed to even try to formulate a plan of escape. Even his sense of direction was gone. Fear had stuffed, stultified his mind that he may not be able to think consciously. The blackness spread in long waves about him, and his darkness and void entered into his brain. His motions, such as they were, were instinctive. He seemed shackled with mighty chains, and his limbs toward responded. His limbs responded sluggishly, like an imbecile's. A terrible horror grew up in him and reared its grisly shape that the dead man was behind him, was stealing upon him from the rear. He no longer thought of lighting the lamp. He no longer thought of anything. Fear filled his whole being. There was room for nothing else. He backed slowly away in the darkness, hands behind him, instinctively feeling the way. With a terrific effort, he partly shook the clinging mist of horror from him and the cold, sweaty clam, this cold sweat clammy upon his body, strove to orient himself. He could see nothing, but the bed was across the, the room, in front of him. He was backing away from it. There was, there was where the dead man was lying. According to all rules of nature, if the thing were, as he felt, behind him, then the old tales were true. Death did implant in lifeless bodies, an unearthly animation, and dead men did roam the shadows to work their ghastly and evil will upon the sons of men. Then, great God, what was man but a wailing infant, lost in the night and beset by frightful things in the black abysses, and the terrible unknown voids of space and time? These conclusions he did not reach by any reasoning process. They leaped full-grown into his terror-dazed brain. He worked his way slowly backward, groping, clinging to the thought that the dead man must be in front of him. Then, his back hands encountered something slick, cold, and clammy, like the touch of death. A scream shook the echoes, followed by the crash of a falling body. The next morning, they who came to the house of death found two corpses in the room, Adam Farrell's 
sheeted body lay motionless upon the bed, and across the room lay the body of Falred, beneath the shelf where Dr. Stein had absentmindedly left his gloves, rubber gloves, slick and clammy to the touch, of a hand groping in the dark. A hand of one fleeing his own fear. Rubber gloves, slick and clammy and cold, like the touch of death. There we go. That one actually had a pretty solid foreshadowing with the glove. The glove! No glove, no love. No glove, no love. We just keep greasing them away. Uh, I think I want to get another one into the Indiana Crime Review. But first, let me close that. And that. And that. That. We. Is there a... No, there's not. I'm pretty... I'm gonna pretty much skip over the poetry. I don't remember what's all in here, but I will... Yeah. There's only like a few poems in there. Just gonna read the stories. Some of them are continual things. I don't know. I'll see how that goes. gaming but now it is truly time to push you to your limits uh oh how, how by the way how are your games today I, how are the overwatchers how have the watches been have you watched to get dirty oh you did change the names my username is mom it's my turn and someone called me mommy I guess I'm one of them now it's it's happened you've made the big transition into common gamer folk say this oh, what was this <laughs> okay Say this deeply, but with the accent of a Native American war chief. Son, to shit your pants is nothing nobler. That is... This is powerful. I don't know if that was deep enough, but... <laughs> deep as thought. We need more shit like that. We need, like, a, a book of, like, Confucius quotes, but they're just all awful. Like, everything's nothing useful. Man who wipes with his hand liberates... Everyone from his hand. <laughs> Son, shit your pants. There's nothing nobler. Put that on a fucking tombstone. Also, re rename myself and these games we've been playing have been refreshing. You guys, do you think, um... I, I mean, I, I, I firmly believe that if depending on what name you pick in some games, you do get uh, a certain type of person that reacts to it negatively. Uh, that's why I took the TTV out of my name. Not so much my feelings were hurt, but they would just throw fucking games. Like, they, they would literally throw it. And then your guys' names combined would remind them of two things that they hate. Uh, one of them is being alone, and the second one is women. And if you remind them that there's women who are with not them, <laughs> you, you, uh, you would focus certain rage. I generally believe that we have a debuff because of the name. What if they do? What if they do debuff all the, like, silly names? That'd be funny. But your games were like normal. Or like quote unquote normal. We have 10 less HP or something. <laughs> less HP. That'd be intense. 
like camping. Every first bullet does 10 more damage. So you're telling me if you made your name like Blizzard is cool, you would like win every game? Oh wait, every first every first bullet from the enemy does ten more damage than mine. Not your your bullets, but that would be cooler if it was your bullets because that would be a power up, right? Yeah, I don't know the name. The name the names do it though. But anyways, before we get into the book, my name is now Anti Foreskin. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. That was good. Two good two good name changes. <laughs> Mom, it's my turn. Anti foreskin, and then whenever they do that, that'd be cool. Because if somebody's going against you and they have an Ana, they'll be like Ana, anti foreskin, and they'll be like, "Yeah, that's his name. It's not that funny." And it's like, "No, no, no, anti him. We can't defeat this tank. <laughs> we need to anti him." And that's and that's a, a lot of wordplay. Crusty. No, actually, the one that sticks in my head the most is Regina Shards. That name is like solid. That's like a ten out of ten name. Why are we going the true crime route, by the way? Oh, this is not actual true crime. This one's not true crime. This one's just fictional. Um, I'm not going the true crime. I'm just reading horror because it was like the genre uh, that it's like easily available in my house. That's not like fucking 900 pages long. I really want to read like Walden or something, but I, I mean, I'd be a really good one to fall asleep to, I guess. But I don't feel bad leaving all my alerts normal reading something like this. And then also I was trying to figure out how to like spend my time uh, better uh, like last month I streamed a lot less because I was trying to like record reading or whatever I'm like why not just do both but I just let people know and uh, I think it would probably help too because all I do is stream overwatch but <laughs> overwatch and working out but also I wanted to read more and the best way to do that is to read every day like to before I go back into like heavier shit it expands the vocabulary if you will but this is not true crime this is fictional this is definitely more gritty um from what I remember I don't know how gritty or how good or bad the writing was it's been so fucking long since i read this one i have another book i can't read it on stream but it's called squid whores of fulton fish market and that one let me tell you that one is a uh, is nice it's, it's it's got all it's got all the layers and textures it's got some tropes in there it's got some fun creative stuff the premise being there's a a, a i think a pimp i think his name is like calamari unironically his name is cal imari or whatever but um it's a pimp Trying to photo scan me a copy. I will not photo scan you a copy. I might just send you the copy I have. I got it. The long story short of it is I knew the lady that wrote it like a long time ago. I have not, I don't, I don't even know if she's alive or anything. Hopefully she's well. Hopefully she's well. But she's the one that turned me onto these books because some of her works in here, I think. And there was one of them was like a friend of hers. I don't know if they're still friends or not, but we'll grease it up. This is way more casual. We can fucking chat and read this shit. I don't, I'm not fucking... I'm not gonna hard stick into it. Alright. What do we got? We got a really short one here. Grease the Horror. Actually, do I need to read the poem? Yeah, fuck it. We'll read the whole thing. Uh, Welcome to Fat City. It's called Pulp City by Roger Cowan. Uh, Welcome to Fat City. The city is a vampire that bleeds, vitality from the soul, breeding. Its own infestation of violence, greed, loathing, and hopelessness, leaving only half-animated corpses wandering the brutal streets, looking for their next fix, the next big score, or the next sure bet. Welcome to Fat City. City of suicide dreams and wasted lives, of sterno burns, bums, junkies, thugs, and ten dollar whores. Of cop killers and killer cops, of dime store hoods and degenerate gangsters, a city populated by the living damned, where being down and out is a way of life, and every cockroach that crawls out of the sewer has its own story to tell. I like the idea of the cockroaches telling you a story, but they're like asking you for a cigarette first. Hey man, I'll tell you a story, just give me a cigarette, please. Please. Slouching towards debauchery, part one. All right, here we go. We're get your adult ears on because we're about to get greasy. I think someone wrote a song about that one time. The cockroaches. There's a cock on my roach. Sitting in one of Fat City's finer gentlemen's clubs, pissed drunk and half-naked women eating my face and grinding her crotch against mine, I've never been more aware of God's innate goodness. 
to have created such enticing elixirs of absolution as these lovely, accommodating ladies, then he must indeed be a benign god. Later, I lay on the hard slab of my motel room bed, chain-smoking camels in the dim half-light half light of the television, ashtray perched on my chest. Wanda, the stripper from the club, is in the bathroom humming something vaguely familiar. I hear the toilet flush and she comes out of the bathroom wearing nothing but a pair of black see-through panties. She's got great tits, the best money can buy. She climbs on top of me. I crush out my smoke and feel my cock harden inside my boxers. As she slides down and takes me in her mouth, I even forget the two suitcases on the other bed. One is filled with cash and the other with several kilos of the best Peruvian powder available. Indeed, God is good. I wake up with my head throbbing like a dull spike has been hammered into my skull. My stomach feels like someone has buried a knife in my gut and I kept and kept on twisting. I can taste whiskey and pizza climbing back up my throat. I swallow hard till I feel it going back down, leaving a trail of fire behind. <laughs> this one's coming out swinging, oh my god. Something about a cigarette. Just a small town girl smoking cigarettes. Through my hangover fogged eyes, I see Wanda opening the motel room door. The suitcase full of cash in one hand and my car keys in the other. The suitcase full of coke is already gone, probably stashed in the trunk of a caddy. My hands fumble under the mattress, looking for the Beretta's 9mm I always keep there. But I, all I feel are the cold, damp sheets. Wanda turns, cigarette in her mouth, and pulls my gun from her inside of her leather jacket. Looking for something, sugar? That's the voice I'm giving Wanda. She says, waving the barrel towards my chest. Yeah, my dick. Figured you might have swiped that as well. Wanda laughs that deep, throaty laugh I found so sexy just a few hours ago. <laughs> but now, like rubbing peroxide in my brain. Oh, but now it was like rubbing peroxide in my brain. You gave it for you. Oh, wait, hold on. Is that her or him? Okay, this is the thing I hate about these. <laughs> There's nobody. Okay. Here's a. This is not a pro tip. This is just a dumbass tip from somebody that reads things. I, I like whenever they do put the fucking and then Walter said thing because it makes it so much easier to read that shit out loud or not reread it four times. You gave that to me for free. And I'll admit you got a pretty jammer. But, there, but the cash and coke's better. They'll last a lot longer anyway. Oh. She's over here making fun of his premature. And to think I bought you pizza, I mumbled, shaking my head. She digs a 20 out of her jacket pocket and tosses it on the dresser. That should cover it, she said as she turns back towards the door. Before leaving, she looks back over her shoulder and smiles. But honestly, I prefer eating at the Y. I sit in bed feeling like the world's premier chump as I listen to her start my car. I light up a camel. Feel the tasty, cool smoke curling around my lungs. I'm still sitting there when I hear the engine fading as she drives away and wishes, wish she'd put a slug in me. A bullet would be easier than what was going to happen to me when Carmine finds out I lost his dope. Suddenly I realize what song she'd been humming in the bathroom earlier. The one that sounded vaguely familiar. It was, We're in the Money. Oh, Bro. Blowjobs, coke, and debauchery. I'll be damned. This is no true crime. And then, hopefully I don't read anything too fucking gnarly. Last time I got caught off guard. Uh, that's the power of cold reads. You just read the fucking thing and you find out the hard way. The ignoble end of the lucky of Lucky Jimmy. Alright, these are gonna be a bunch of these ones where people just mess up. <laughs> See this? Lucky Jimmy was a first-rate yeg whose skills were always in demand. Renowned for his prowess and as a second-story man and a deft fingers that could stroke the combination out of any, even the most stubborn of safes, the kind of expertise didn't come cheap. His brains weren't bad either. He could plan as well as execute, a valuable commodity in a town populated with more than its share of dropout, dropouts, degenerates, and dull-witted imbeciles. He had an uncanny knack for avoiding the coppers and was proud that he had never been arrested. His only brush with the law coming when he was pulled over for doing 40 in a school zone. Although he had about 60 grand in stolen rocks in his trunk, Jimmy played it cool, 
took his ticket, thanked the officer, and was off to on his merry way. Did they all weave together to explain how the A-team was born or something? Uh, I know one of them has a through line. There's, I think a lot of them, it's just like a, what do you call it? I keep, a compendium of sorts. Where this is like a bunch of different authors came together for this one. Like somebody or, organized it. I want to say the sl slouching towards debauchery part one. The, there's going to be multiple parts of that one. But I, th I think they take place in the same place. I'm just assuming that. We'll find out the hard way. But Jimmy had one dangerous vice. <laughs> he liked to gamble. What was worse, he wasn't very good at it. Though he liked to fancy himself a gentleman a gentleman gambler, dressing only in the finest hand-tailored silk, su <laughs> silk suits. Jimmy's gay. Silk suits <laughs> spreading cash around the casinos and back alley, gambling halls like a well-heeled high roller. It never failed that before long he would be broke again and looking to borrow from local shysters until his next big score. Nobody knows just when or why Jimmy began to lose his nerve. Taking notes for degenerate city. That's the spirit. Some say a woman was to blame. Others claimed he picked up a nasty coke habit, though no one could actually ever remember seeing him use. But most agreed it was when a big job went south and one of Jimmy's best mates was shot to hell by some cowboy cop with a happy trigger finger. Of course, lucky Jimmy got away free as a bird, but he must have realized that his luck wouldn't hold forever. He began blowing off jobs. Bro, that's, that's a powerful sentence right there. He began blowing off jobs, finding excuses not to work, and spending more and more time spreading his rapidly depleting cash supply around the crab tables. Near the end, he could be found cadging drinks in a variety of shabby dives and beer joints, looking more desperate with each passing day, until the night he was found face down in the gutter, two slugs from a thirty-eight in the back of his skull, and that was the ignoble end of Lucky Jimmy's luck. He started blowing jobs. And that was the end of Jimmy. The crew. More two. There will be some episodic adventures here. There's a lot of just for... I like... I kind of like that aspect of it. Of just... Like, a five paragraph story. That's just to the point. The crew. The crew that worked out of the back of the Blue Monkey Lounge. Was technically part of the... Abadano. Abadano crime family. Is that right? I don't know my Italian. But in reality, we're just a bunch of bottom feeders. Nickel and diming their way along. Banished to the furthest peripheries of the organized crime world, they never could seem to pull off that one big score. But they still fancied themselves real wise guys. Powdering their speech and dress left their characters from Hollywood flicks like Goodfellas and Reservoir Dogs. So when they heard an armored truck that was a give up, they saw it was a chance to prove they were big-time players, and not just mechanics and dime store desperados. The armored car driver was into a member was into a member of the crew for twenty large, and grew to give up the truck for a piece of the action. True, the other two guards would have to be wasted, but with close to ten million at stake, a little blood was going to deter them. A little blood wasn't going to deter them. They began meeting every night in the storeroom of the Blue Monkey. Hashing out plans they thought were certain to be foolproof, but the more they planned, the more certain they became the jobs. The job was just too much for their crew alone. They were already down a couple of guys, with angels with angels doing five years in the Rikers for burglary, and Pete Galleria getting stomped to death by some podunk I like that phrase podunk podunk dock worker and a cheap gen jive. Ricks. Angels had most of the brains in the outfit, seeing as he had actually gone all the way to the 12th grade, and Pete had been their muscle. <laughs> going against their better judgment, they decided to bring in a couple of independents. They were mostly local mooks. I like that phrase too, mooks. What a mook! Who were willing to work for wages instead of percentages, but they also reached out to a couple of guys from uptown. Real gangsters. Real gangster shit. Who once, uh, once, 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 and took over most of the practical planning. They went hashed out. They went hashed out every detail, deconstructed every scenario until they were certain they had come up with a foolproof. Okay, this is gonna be at the reliant one. Foolproof plan. In fact, it looked pretty damned good and had an excellent chance of success. There's an old saying: 
Even the sun shines on a dog's ass some days. But no mangy, feral cur had even ever had the luck as poor as that of the Blue Monkey crew. What none of the crew knew was one of the uptown wise guys had been working for the feds ever since they'd been busted. They'd busted him for dealing H. I'm assuming that H is heroin. In exchange for the get out of jail free card and new identity, he gave them the Blue Monkey's crew on their $10 million heist. Now when the crew, nearly pissing their pants in anticipation, opened up the back of that armored car, instead of bags of glory, they got half a dozen armed FBI agents pointing their weapons right back at them. And that, my friend, was the end of the line for the Blue Monkey crew. Wow. Never have I ate my own words in less than 30 seconds, where I thought the story was going to be a through line, and it was not. They were just arrested. I like the idea of that. How many times do you think that's happened where somebody's like, oh, I think we could rob a bank. And then they, they, they couldn't. They, they were not capable. They did not have the skills to rob a bank successfully. So they just get like thousands of times. I'm sure there's been a bunch of impromptu ones where somebody just had like a bad day. And they're just like, fuck it. I'm taking the gun to the bank. <laughs> and then they get there and they, they just don't have the nerve for it. They don't have the nerve for it or the planning. There are many bank robbers, most unsuccessful. Yeah, there's only a few. The ones you hear about are like the like that one dude who got out like five years ago. He made like a YouTube channel about it. But he like robbed like 15 banks or something like that successfully. And I can't I don't remember why he got caught. I think it was like a tax thing. That's usually how they catch you on those things. Well, other than the obvious cameras everywhere. But like if you get successfully make away with the money, they'll find it that way. Slouching towards debauchery part two. All right, here we go. It took less than a week to locate Wanda. The smart play would have been to get as far away from Fat City as possible, dump the coke on the first buyer, and then make like an invisible man. But Wanda was a Fat City girl. Like, the name of the city is Fat City. She's not a Fat City girl. Like, a girl who's fat in the city. It's like, it's Fat City and then girl. And she did exactly what I expected her to do. She hung close. Close to family, friends, and the city she knew well. Expecting the city's size to lend her a measure of anonymity, but even in a city this vast, it could only offer so much protection. It was the only a matter of asking the right questions in the right way, and waiting for her to be lulled into a false sense of security. I caught her sneaking into a teeny apartment uptown. It belonged to one of Wanda's old lovers, who still carried a torch for her. I know. I had to break her legs, several ribs, and most of her fingers before she revealed Wanda's location. Wanda had tried to disguise herself, dyed her hair blonde, shortened it, and was sporting sunglasses to hide her eyes. But there was no disguising that sexy walk, gorgeous face, and legs that went on forever. She did. <laughs> fat titty girl? I said fat city. <coughs> city! Wanda had tried to disguise. I'm sorry, the legs that went on forever. She didn't even. She didn't see me as I slipped up behind her. As she was walk was unlocking the door, I shoved her hard, pushing her through the door where she collapsed to the floor. When she saw who I was, I could see both shock and fear running across her face. You, 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 goddamn you! She stuttered. He already has, I said, kicking the door closed behind me. She began scooting backwards, dragging her skirt up enough to display a gorgeous portion of seductively nude thigh. My, my boyfriend Mike, he'll be back in. What? I said. Be back any minute now? Sorry to disappoint you, love, but your honey won't be swooping in to save you. She's still lying in a warehouse down by the docks. If she's lucky, she'll live. I believe her name was Lita, though, not Mike. At least that's what she said after I snapped her elbow. Wanda clapped her hands over her face and began to cry. I snatched her by the wrist and dragged her to her feet. Okay, doll, where's the cash and coke? I growled. Fear had robbed her of the ability to form actual words, but from the gibberish and nodding, I could figure she was telling me it was in the bedroom. Still grasping her wrist, I pulled her along behind me, tossing her on the bed hard enough that her head smacked up against the headboard. Last chance, Wanda. Where are my goods? I drew back my hand, ready to slap her, about, slap her around a bit when she pointed a quaking hand at the closet. I jerked open the closet doors and found both suitcases on the floor. I laid them on the bed where Wanda had curled up in a fetal position. It was making a mewling noise. A mewling noise. <laughs> a dying cat. 
I cracked open the coke first, since it wasn't mine, and if any of it was missing, it'd be me who had to make up the difference. It's all there, Wanda managed to croak in a teeny voice. The coke, anyway. We spent about six grand of the cash. A cursory glance inside both cases seemed to bear her story out. I latched both cases and gave her my scariest glare. Where the fuck's my gun? She only hesitated for a moment. Before gesturing towards the nightstand, probably figuring a bullet would be easier than what I might have in mind. I opened the drawer and pulled out my Beretta. I could see Wanda's eyes go wide as I examined the gun. A dark stain appeared on the messy sheets, but she didn't even seem aware. She just pissed herself. I grabbed her by the shoulder and lifted her off the bed. Don't worry, darling. I ain't gonna put a bullet in that pretty head. She sagged in my arms, as if the possibility of getting spared had sucked all the life right out of her. So certain she had been of her impending death. What time frame is this again? Uh, I have no idea. It doesn't really say. I, I will say this was published in 2014. So I don't know if it's like a real throwback thing or if it's like just 2010s. Well, I'd have to assume it's like throwback. I, I don't know why every time I read stories like this, I just imagine it's just 1980 or like 90s maybe even. She sagged in my arms with the possibility, Oh, you're impending death? And, nah, guns really ain't my style, I said, grinning and pulling the ice pick from inside my jacket. Oh, God, please, Johnny, don't kill me, she began blubbering. Began to blubber? I felt my grin grow larger, till I felt like my face was ready to split in two. So you do know who I am, I said. And yet you stole, still stole from me? The fear was back on her, so thick I could smell it. It was a scent I loved, thrived on, could almost live on. I didn't know then. I swear I didn't know till I saw your picture in the paper yesterday. I didn't know he was Johnny Palizzo. You were Lizzo? This dude's Lizzo? Johnny Palizzo? And that you worked for Carmine. I knew what pictures she was talking about. It was of me and Carmine Abadano. Abadano at the charity function. I thought I looked pretty spiffy standing there between Carmine and Cap Capo di Tutti, Cappy of Fat City. Oh my gosh, what a, what a title. And the mayor himself. Yeah, the cash you stole was mine, but the coke belonged to Carmine, I said. That's when she broke away from me and dashed into the bathroom, slamming the door behind her. I could hear her puking her guts up in the toilet. I gave her a few last precious seconds before I kicked in the door and wadded in, slipping on a pair of black leather gloves. She was still on her knees beside the toilet, her mascara running in streaks down her cheeks. When I grabbed her by the... <laughs> when I grabbed her by the hair and slid the ice pick into the base of her neck and up into her brain, I don't think she even felt any pain. At least I hope she didn't feel anything. She wasn't such a bad gal, just a little greedy. But hell, ain't we all? Ooh, a little greedy. Bro's out here murdering people. Johnny Palazzo. Killing time. We woke, uh, we woke up one morning to the baby crying and the wife sighing. We're out of formula, she said, and buried her head in the sack. stack of bills piled so high they're leaning like the tower you always see in postcards. The mortgage was 80 days past due, and now the finance company is threatening to repossess the car. I opened up the refrigerator and saw how bare it was, just one crazy slice of bologna, hard and curling around the edges. I slammed the door and stomped out of the room and right out of the house. I climbed behind the wheel of my soon-to-be-repossessed Ford. But for the life of me, I couldn't decide where to go. So I put her in gear and headed downtown. My daddy always told me, Son... Work hard and walk an honest path and great things you'll achieve. But all the jobs moved away and my unemployment had dried up. So I headed down to the welfare office, where the lady there looked at me as if I was a bug and said, Boy, your back ain't broke. So I got a job making minimum wage. Not enough left after taxes, even to buy groceries for a week. I guess maybe everybody's got, got a breaking point, and I guess I just have reached mine. I went to the closet and got my gun and drove straight down to the First National Bank, where I made a hasty withdrawal of about 15 grand of somebody else's cash. It only took the cops two hours to catch me. I didn't put up too much of a fight, 
I reckon my wife and baby's son are going to be better off without me. Give her a chance to meet somebody who could do better than 725 an hour. The judge sentenced me to 15 years and 56 days. That's $2.75 of day paying back the debt I owed. So now I'm killing time in my 5 by 9 foot cell. And when I get out of here, my hair will be starting to gray. No one's going to hire an ex-con. Each day I get a little meaner and think about the day I get released. And how I'm going to shoot the eyes out of every damn son of a bitch that put me away. And we continue on to the main... Slouching towards debauchery, part three. What's, uh... What's this? I don't like that one. Uh, no, I'll go by Ben. And then, uh... What? Carl was as nervous as long tail. Carl was as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. That's a classic one. That's that's something your great grandma would say. Pull up a picture of debauchery. <laughs> Check that. He wasn't nervous. He was scared plum stinking shitless. He had been sitting in his car across the street from the Blue Monkey Lounge for the Oh wait, they do tie together. Fuck, I spoke too soon earlier. He was sitting across the street from the Blue Monkey Lounge for the past hour, watching sharp-dressed wise guys in thousand-dollar suits coming and going accompanied by a number of long-legged beautiful dames. Oof. Long-legged. About what's this guy's obsession with legs? About 15 minutes ago, Carmine Abadano, Abadano had arrived with his wife, Christina. The way this is spelled hurts my entire body. Followed a few minutes later by Johnny Palazzo with a stunning blonde on each arm. Palazzo, better known as Johnny Zip, was a tall and strikingly handsome bearing... was tall and un... was fucking tall and strikingly handsome, bearing a great resemblance to the actor Andy Garcia. And then I'm going to look that up. I want to know what Andy Garcia looks like. Oh, Andy Garcia. Oh, okay. Yo, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know what this man looks like. Hold on, give me one second, everybody. Hold on one second, everybody. You want to see Andy Garcia? Can it save as a fucking JPEG though? Why is why is this world like this? Yo, he looks cool as shit old though. Side note. I heard your reading smut. Hell yeah. I heard you're reading smut. Oh, it's gonna get pretty smutty. Just in time for the smut. Hope you're I hope everyone who's rating is ready for the smut convention. Alright, that's not Andy Garcia. That's a fucking bullseye window. But here comes the Andinator. Bam, look at that. Take this. Take the knees. That's what the guy looks like. He looks like this low-quality JPEG of Andy Garcia. Allegedly. Thank you for the shouting him out. Thank you. Thank you, THCs. That's what I heard. Is that what you rated? So you could you could also hear about the smut. No, I'm just reading about crime and murder instead, which is, that's like smut. Like, uh, smut violence. Do, 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 do. But we shall continue. Run into the bathroom one second. Yo, I'll run to the bathroom too. We can all run to the bathroom. Everyone piss. Great pisser in the shitter tonight. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, good. Sorry. <clears throat> Oh, uh, resemblance to the actor Andy Garcia. Carl fumbled the thirty-eight in the, of the glove box. Wait, what? Of the glove box? And for the hundredth time, checked to make sure it was loaded. He meant to put a bullet in Johnny Zipper's head, but if he didn't didn't get a hold of his nerves, there was a damn good chance he was going to wind up shooting himself. Wanda had gone slumming once in the slumming once in the Blue Monkey, back when it had been a hangout for low lives and bottom feeders. Said she'd even had Pete Goleria buy her a drink. She'd found him charming, not at all the monster he was made out to be, but Wanda was never a very good judge was never a very good judge of character. Uh, for anybody that's new here, Wanda just uh, she caught a fucking ice pick to the back of her head in the last chapter of this, so uh yeah, not not good to judge of character. 
Whoa, the monkey had always been mob mob run. But after the gang that had used the place got busted trying to hijack an armored car full of feds, Carmine had taken over. Eventually, he turned the place over to his brother Lou, who spruced the place up, put on some crap and blackjack tables. Crap tables? Ew. Couple roulette, wheel, couple roulette wheels and reopened a high-class gambling joint. Wanda had been a good kid. Sure, she was kind of dumb, had terrible taste in men, and was an absolute magnet for shit luck. But none of that meant she deserved to have an ice pick stuck in her skull, left to rot in the stinking floor of a, of a toilet. Johnny should have just taken his money and his coke and left. Wanda couldn't have stopped him. Hell, she'd probably been too terrified by the time he'd killed her to even remember her own name. What's more, she was Carl's kid's sister, and when some stinking guinea stabs your sister with an ice pick, there's no choice left but to waste the cocksucker. It had, been it had taken Carl a lot of work to convince Lita to give Palizzo up. The girl was terrified Johnny would find out and come back and finish the job he'd started. Lita had no idea that Johnny was the guy Lita had ripped off, but she knew whoever he was, whatever it was, he had to be connected to be... Sorry, there's like there should be a comma here. That would help. <laughs> he had to be connected to be traveling with so much dope and money and just leave it out for some dumb twat stripper to steal. It had to be a guy who wasn't used to being robbed. Someone tough enough that he didn't believe anybody would dare steal from him. When Johnny had shown up at the beauty parlor looking for Wanda, Lita had immediately known who he was and just who it was Wanda had robbed. She felt her gorge rise, but tried to appear calm as she denied she knew where Wanda had disappeared. Sure, they'd had a thing, but... That was over a long time ago, she'd said, and Johnny had just gone on smiling that crazy smile and nodding his head, but his eyes had been ice, unflinching, and disbelieving. Finally, he thanked Lita politely and left by the front door. Why did her gorge rise? I don't know what a... Hold on. What does that even mean? Look that shit up. Gorge rising. Oh, feel sick and disgusted or angry. My gorge rises, which I, I don't know. I was thinking something else. If your gorge rises, you feel sick and disgusted. All right, fair, fair enough. And let's do the whole thing where you're lost for two seconds and you find it again. Violent anger. Finally, he thanked Lita politely and left by the front door. Lita had sighed in relief, quickly locked the shop up, and zipped, slipped out the back only to walk straight into Johnny Zipper, who was standing in the alley beside a black BMW. He opened the passenger door and gestured, still smiling. Hop in, Lita. Let's go get a cup of coffee. Lita's eye... <laughs> oh, no. Thighed in relief. Lita eyed the far end of the alley. Knew she'd never make it and slid into the passenger seat. Johnny shut the door and got behind the wheel, and even an hour later, when he was beating Lita almost to death, he never stopped smiling. Another 15 minutes or so passed as Carl worked at lowering his pulse below 100. He snapped the gun into his ankle holster, ankle holster, pulled his pant leg down over it, and checked himself in the rearview mirror. Not too bad, he thought. A little sweat still on his forehead, but it was a hot night, and he was wearing a suit, so reasonable enough to expect some sweat. I like how this guy is about to try to murder someone, and he's like trying to have confidence. <laughs> like, he's like going through that right now, trying to like make sure he's he feels good. <laughs> like Carl opened the door, opened the car door, and stepped out. Checked both ways before crossing the street, smoothing the wrinkles of his silk jacket as he walked. The fat grease ball at the door barely gave him a glance. Had Carl raised the back of his jacket to make sure he wasn't packing and waved him onto the door. The place was brighter than Carl expected. From Wanda's description, Carl had been expecting a dingy club with low lights dressed up in safari decor. A glorified tiki bar, in other words, but this place was lit up like the best casinos in Vegas or Atlantic City. 
The furnishings are all appeared to be very new and modern, done up in leather and rich, dark mahogany. <laughs> the coping mechanism. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still hot. I still got it. And he's about to go fight. Carl made his way to the bar and ordered a gin and tonic. A tall, black man with a shaved head. I like the way I said that. Dressed in a white shirt and red vest, took Carl's order. Making his drink with the smooth grace and efficiency of an aging athlete. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I can't. I'm, <laughs> why? I, uh, well. Ugh. Carl paid with a 20 and told the bartender to keep the change. Apparently this was perfectly normal as the bartender gave the perfunctory thank you and quickly back to wiping down the counter. Carl, 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 barely tasted the drink as his eyes scanned the room, looking for his target. It took him only a few minutes to spot Johnny's tall, handsome head, head standing at one of the craps tables, one of the craps table, looking for all the world, looking for all the world like King Turd of Shit Mountain, surrounded by his ever-present posse of sycophants, and well-endowed broads and sleek gowns. With the grace of a post, the grace of post DUI Tiger Woods, he managed to get the drink into his mouth. <laughs> I like that. Yo, that story's kind of funny. The Tiger Woods one, because I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not gonna say you should get a DUI, but in that particular scenario, the way that happened, it was kind of funny because he—I don't even think he got that far. I think he was like in his neighborhood just smashed into a, if I can remember correctly, like the sign of his gated community or whatever the fuck. Which, you know what, if he, if he had a DUI, that's kind of funny, that means like two of the best golfers in the entire world, if not more, were like alcoholics. Because there's the other guy, I can't think of the name of the other guy, but the other guy's like wild, like he does no exercise, he's like the Jack Black of fucking golf. He just, he's just hanging out, just chilling and good at what he does. He downed the last of his drink and stood and headed towards the bathroom. He had a brief, unpleasant encounter when he accidentally bumped into Joe Bugs, who was coming out of the john just as Carl was going. Bugs was one of Carmine's most brutal hitmen and was rumored to have a notoriously short fuse. One story had him blowing a guy's head off who had a cold and forgot to cover his nose when he sneezed. But that's relatable. You know what? I think uh, Joe Bugs is not that. He's not a bad guy. He's based. But instead of blowing a hole in Carl's head, Joe just nodded at Carl's stammering apology and went on about his business. Carl locked himself in the stall, in the last stall, dropped his trousers and sat on the cold porcelain, still, till the shaking began to subside. When he finally felt he could walk again, he transferred his thirty-eight from his ankle holster to the front pocket of his jacket, emptied his bladder, and pulled up his pants. Washing up at the sink, Carl caught a gl I like the idea- Oh, wait, no, he sat. <laughs> this dude sat down to pee. Washing up at the sink, Carl caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror and was surprised and a bit disturbed at just how normal he appeared. Just seemed like someone getting ready to commit murder should, well, look, you know, less normal. Less like a guy who just took a piss and was headed back to the bar for another round and a bit of bullshit with his pals. There should be some kind of deranged tick in his eye, or psychotic, psychopathic leer on his face. Not this unsettling normalcy. Howdy, Platt. Not too much? We're just reading away. Uh, this... Debauchery. Bro, are you kidding me? I want to say more than 60% of all golfers are fucking drunk. Well, in my life, all the people I know who go golfing, they just drink. Uh, I figured out years ago that when I liked drinking with friends or whatever, I would just drink with friends and we'd just talk. I didn't, like, pretend to want to go do an activity to fucking do that. <laughs> like, like we would just talk. But I think golfing, a lot like fishing, is one of those ones where you can uh, ward off most of the women and children, so to speak, to not want to go with you. So then you get to just be there. Or, or in the case of golf, it's such a boring activity or like, you really gotta want to be there, because that shit's boring as fuck, I'm gonna be honest. Like, I, I have no interest in it. You were a very garage beer kind of guy. I am 100% a garage beer kind of guy. 
I, I, I am, a, I am a hundred percent. I would, I actually have a garage refrigerator. It's not plugged in, but I would keep beer in there, and I would be like, let's just go in the garage and drink the beer and talk or work on something or whatever the fuck. But like, yeah, sub Tate Ira, Tate Ira. Thanks again for acting to my video. Oh no, bro, no, there was nothing. It took me so long to do it. <laughs> it took me way too long to do it. Hope you're doing good. I had to go to a company golf event and we got there at 6 a.m. and by 10 a.m. I was hammered. Exactly, stink, stink nugget. Like golf, like golf is like a, a weird, justified way to be drunk, like while doing it. I'm doing good, bro. How about you? I'm doing pretty well. Vince is one wild old man. Yeah, he is. He he puts his blood, sweat, and tears in that shit. Um, yeah, no, no, golf. Like it's a weird one. It's the same with fishing. Like people go drink. And I'm just like, I don't, I'm a different kind of drunk. I know that's why I realized that is like, if I get drunk, the most I want to do is like play guitar for a little bit. I don't want to, I don't want to be out in a boat. <laughs> that sounds awful. Actually. I'm one of those sitters. Bro, fishing requires more fucking strength than I thought it would. Well, if you, depends where you're fishing, but yeah. <laughs> what do you think is going to be easy? Like all the fish are going to be like one pounders. Even the fucking little tiny ones, they fight, dude. Looking great, bro. Hell yeah. I appreciate it, bro. We, we, I've been, uh, I, okay. The only other update is I broke another fucking boxing thing. So like, I just keep breaking all my fucking equipment. So I did push-ups the other day for the first time in a while. And those, those actually sucked, but there'll be more push-ups and cardio this month and it'll be good for me. But I gotta, I gotta fucking fix my bags so I can hang out my heavy again. Meanwhile. The next few minutes seemed to move in slow motion for Carl. It was like he was outside his body, like he was watching a scene on a movie screen. He saw himself pushing open the bathroom door, quickly scanning the crowd until he found Johnny, still playing craps at the same table. He saw himself weave his way through the crowd, but all the time his eyes were locked on the back of Johnny's head. Watching from a distance, his whole demeanor seemed to shout, Assassin! Assassin! But nobody paid him the slightest attention. They were safe here. This was their world. No one would dare cause a disruption here or dare to harm one of their crown princes. Ten feet away and Carl's hand curled around the grip of his gun. Eight feet away he cocks the hammer, flicks the safety. Six feet away he calls out jovially. Hey Johnny! Johnny Polizio! <laughs> I just destroyed his name. Four feet away and Johnny is turning, ready to greet another of his compatriots. His ever-present grin still glued to his face. Three feet away, Carl raises his gun and fires right one button uh and johnny's grin disappears in a crimson mist the force of the bullet spins his body sideways and he collapses across the table his hands open and a pair of dice rolls out into the green felt snake eyes johnny's finally crapped out this entire story <laughs> this entire story was made so they could do that one joke Johnny is finally crapped out. The place goes silent. Carl realizes it's so quiet you can hear a mouse fart. He had expected panic, a rush for the doors. That's how he planned his escape. Just follow the crowd as they push towards the exit. Carl guessed. Carl guesses he had seen too many movies, or maybe since this was a gangster club, and these were the kinds of guys who couldn't afford to panic. Carl doesn't know who fired first. It sounds like a dozen guns all blazing at once and his body is riddled. Carl figures it really didn't matter who shot first. He knows it's the one it's the one that Joe Bugs fires into his brain that kills him. Push-ups. Yes. I need to send that bag. Send me the bag, homie. Give me the bag. Meanwhile, gun crazy. It was a typical whiz-bang Saturday at night in August. You know the kind. Hot and sticky, with a chance of wet and steamy, if you know what I mean. The, uh, the kind of night that seems to ooze violence and bad craziness. Luckily, the heat was keeping most people safe inside, their air-conditioned cocoons, downing cold beers and watching reruns of CSI. Philly T-Bird was, for once, grateful for the heat. It kept the streets cleared of citizens and potential do-gooders who might make the job at hand a bit more complicated than a simple stick-up. Philly sat in the car, keeping the engine gunned and humming, the AC blasting icy air while soft Motown wafted the Camaro speakers. The Camaro had been jacked from the parking lot of a Quick Mart just two days ago, 
but it was already sporting a new paint job and a set of tags. Inside the Korean liquor store, his partner, Two-Tone, was acquainted... I like that. The bro's name is fucking Two-Tone. Was acquainting the proprietor's head with the butt end of his 9mm. Across the street, a couple of tough, young Latinos... Oh, in wife beaters and pegged jeans. Well, who's out here pegging the young Latinos? That's messed up. Pegged jeans stood outside the Taylor tattoo parlor, comparing skin jobs and arguing in some kind of street Spanish. <laughs> I like that. Arguing in some kind of street Spanish. Cigarettes dangled from their lips, their arms and shoulders rippling with more muscle than kids that age needed. Drunk on their own adolescent testosterone, they were ready to explode into senseless acts of violence at the slightest provocation. Philly didn't pay them much mind. They, knives, muscles, and youth. He had guns. Experience and a total lack of mortal morality for human life. It'd be no contest if they started it either. They'd be left drowning in pools of their own blood if they had so much as approached the Camaro. But they wouldn't even get a chance as Two-Tone was hauling ass towards the car, a sack of money in one hand and nine mil in the other. The elderly, bow-legged owner followed him out the door, blood streaming out the side of his head, waving a fist and screaming, Fluck you! You fucking criminal bastard! Tone jumped into the passenger seat and slammed the door, laughing maniacally. Philly always thought Tone's laugh... What do you think the laugh is? <laughs> Phil always thought Tone's laugh made him sound slightly psychotic, which is probably about right. No way could anyone at cra as crazy as Tone be sane. That's fried rice, you plick, Tone said, quoting Mel Gibson from Lethal Weapon. Then, for absolutely no conceivable reason, he let go with a burst from his 9mm. Most of the bullets careened wildly off the side of the building. One shattered the liquor store's plate glass window, and defying all logic, one slammed the old proprietor right between his eyes, spraying the sidewalk with blood and brains. As Philly slammed the car into gear and peeled away, leaving nothing behind but smoke and two black streaks, he casually observed that Korean brains looked like everyone, just like everyone else's. Fifteen minutes later, and the Camaro was parked in Philly's brother's garage, undergoing a rapid makeover. A few days it would be riding on the back of a trailer headed west with new paint and a ven, ready to be sold to some unsuspecting bugger who'd think he just scored the primo deal of the century. Four hours after the robbery, Philly and Tone were jacked on Daladid. Oh, I'm sorry, Daladude and Mad Dog 2020, both so fucked up they could barely respond when the cops kicked in the door to their shitty garage garbage cluttered apartment. Philly didn't even try to resist when they slammed his face down to the floor and slapped the cuffs on his wrist. Two-Tone seemed ready to go along peacefully when some temporary mad urge overcame his drug-induced languor. It might only have been the survival instinct of a lifelong criminal that caused him to suddenly reach for a cop's gun. <laughs> the cop, some fresh-faced Wookiee, still sporting the remains of his high school acne, never could figure out how half-wasted junkie managed to wrest his gun from him. Tone barely had time to cock his... Pilford 38 before his body was riddled by a barrage of bullets from the other officers. For a few seconds, he danced and spun comically like a manic, maniacal manipulated marionette. Fuck you. Fuck this alliteration. Maniacal manipulated marionette before flopping to the dirty linoleum. As he lay there dying in a pool of his own blood and shit, the last thought that went through his head was how he was going to explain missing Sunday dinner to his ma. Ah, uh, yes. You know? No, you know. If you know, you know. And we uh, miti mitigate. We rotate our way to Rick's. Normally, I wouldn't do my drinking at a place like Rick's. But I was in an ugly mood. And Rick's just seemed like the place to swallow a couple of flagons of horse piss. And maybe bust some wise bastards in the chops. I'd just lost the only job I could find, and my electric had been cut off for non-payment. Then this morning, my wife had taken our baby girl and moved back to Hoboken with her parents. So there I was, in the worst dive in Fat City. Drowning my troubles with some foul liquid that bore only a passing resemblance to beer. The general, degenerate atmosphere, did nothing to improve my mood, instead feeling my belly full of hatred and self-loathing. It wasn't a good time for me and Pete Galleria to take the seat beside me at the bar. 
elbowing an extremely inebriated Lucky Jimmy out of the way to make room for this thick frame. He immediately began downing shots of something masquerading as bourbon, like they were going to declare prohibition tomorrow. Pete was a plenty vicious bastard when sober. Drunk, he was a complete animal. Everybody was scared of him, and for good reason. He had been known to beat men to death with his bare hands, though he wasn't adverse to using a knife or a gun or a piece of steel pipe if a fight wasn't going his way. Even scarier, it was rumored he was in good with the Blue Monkey crew, which meant he was a made dude, and that made him untouchable. He was one of the nastiest sons of bitches to ever haunt the streets of Fat City. And there he was, piss-faced and homicidal, sitting right beside me. I could feel the heat of barely restrained violence pouring off him like a polecat stench. Everybody doesn't know a polecat is a skunk. His aggression feeding my own latent hostility, and when he began nudging me with his elbow, I nudged back. Hard. He turned and gave me a look that had reduced braver men than I into a quivering balls of jelly. But I wasn't having any of it. Not fucking today. Instead, I returned his glare with one of my own. Funny, but he didn't seem all that impressed, so I guessed I needed to work on my own fear-inducing stare. Still, we looked each other up and down, sizing each other up like a pair of pit bulls preparing to rip the other's throat out. It was one of those balls-to-the-wall moments that happened to everybody at some point. Some asshole was about to get hurt and I wasn't going to make and I wasn't going to make sure it wasn't me. He had about 40, maybe 50 pounds on me, but it was mostly fat. I had spent too many years working the docks to have time to sit around and grow soft. If it came to fisty cuffs, I could probably drop him pretty quick. I think Pete knew it too and wasn't going to allow this degenerate to degenerate into a fair fight. Why polecat? I don't know why it's polecat. I, I just know it's like the European of it. Uh, name for it. I heard the gun before I saw it. Damn, he was fast. He'd gotten the gun out so quick I couldn't believe I was already dead. But old Pete must have been even drunker than me. Missing at such a close range was one fluke I couldn't count on again. As Pete raised the thirty-eight for another shot, I brought my mug of beer crashing against the side of his head. Unlike the movies, the glass didn't shatter. Instead, it made an ugly thump. And a huge gush appeared in the side of Pete's head, splattered me with blood, and I like that, and sending mean Pete to his knees. I didn't even give him a chance to recover. I kicked the gun out of his hand and delivered a perfect right to his jaw that left him lying flat on his back. His face was contorted in fear and disbelief. He had never dreamt, so no, some no name podunk, there it is again, podunk, like me, could ever best a grade A hard case like him. He was case hardened. It was probably the fastest beating he ever took. Hell, it was probably the only fight Pete had ever lost. And I knew he would never, ever allow that to go unavenged. I could see his gun there on the floor, but guns never were my style. I started with my fists, but soon I got to the stomping. By the time I was done with the boot, boot work, Pete didn't have much of a face left. One of his eyeballs dangled from its socket, and the other disappeared completely. What few teeth he had were permanently embedded to the tread of my boot, and his nose shoved deep inside his nasal cavity. The joint was dead silent. Even the real hard cases were looking a little pale around the gill. I was vaguely concerned one of them might be rat me out to the Blue Monkey crew, and one day they'd be fishing my body out of the river. But it was a distant thought, lost somewhere in the vague fog of my own revulsion. But then again, Pete was pretty well disliked. It was known to Welsh on his bets. There was a good chance my name would never be mentioned, but just in case, I think I might be joining my wife in Hoboken. Oh, here, oh, we're, oh, we're going the whole way around now. Now we get a love story. The next one says it's a love story, a fat city love story. I wish I had a fucking nigga with the flowers. Like a like a love song thing to play, but I I do not I did not prepare that far ahead. Um, so I'll just put, like, s fucking, uh, spooky music. I stood in the dark looking out the window at the lights of the city. The skyscrapers uptown shimmering like palaces of concrete and glass. Down in the corner, the whores were open for business, displaying as much skin as legal and waving as passing cars. 
I leaned my head against the glass and felt the August heat trying to push its way into the room. The dingy, little efficiency was supposed to be air-conditioned, but the teeny window unit barely cranked out enough air to lower the temp even a few degrees. Sweat ran down my naked torso in rivulets as I drained the last delicious drought of my beer from the bottle. Was that a clown horn? A clown horn? I was it? Mandy rolled over in the bed, and the springs groaned and creaking as she kicked off the sweat-saturated sheets, her small breasts rising and falling like two perfect rubies illuminated by the pale light streaming in through the dirty window. I like reading that like that, though. That sounds like way more fucking terrible. No, that's not it. <laughs> I felt rather than saw her wake up. I could feel her staring at me with those huge doll-like eyes. Actually, okay, this just brings up a, a premise. Wait, a clown horn? Nigga with the flowers! Um, reading, uh, like, reading, uh, like a, like an actual romance novel or one of those, like, sex books, but reading it like it's a fucking horror story, that would be hilarious. Like, I, it wouldn't be, I wouldn't, I don't know. I think the vibes of it would be, like, cursed. Is that gonna be my, be the pause sound? <laughs> Mandy rolled over in bed. Oh, anyway, uh, I felt rather than saw her wake up, I could feel her staring at me with those huge doll-like eyes. Eyes that could penetrate my tough guy armor, reduce me to just another love sick sap who fell for some dame's innocent act. She sat up in the bed, her nakedness distracting me from my plans and schemes. She lighted the cigarette from the, night's, with the, from the nightstand, inhaled deeply, and studied me with those x-ray eyes. Or were they x-rated eyes? I felt her as... Absorbed by my own nakedness as I was ever with hers. Mutual lust, if not love, at the least. I certainly loved her. Hadn't I proved that for a certain tonight? Mandy was not what you'd call a classic beauty. No Greta Garbo or Lauren Bacall here. But she certainly was not your typical fat city bimbo either. No dyed blonde hair or silicone tits. Instead, her body was taut, teeny, and almost boyish with hard little nubs that could barely be called breasts. She had great legs, though, and the best ass I'd ever seen. The best ass this side of the Mississippi. <laughs> Her waifish face was framed by short, dark bobbed hair and set off by a pair of almost impossibly large brown eyes and pert, upturned nose. One of her eyes was puffy and turning an ugly purple, a final farewell punch from her scumbag husband. These guys are really into, like, they love legs. That's, I think that's like a, that's like an older guy thing. I sat down on the edge of the ratty twin bed that she had been sharing with her old man for the past six months or so. I was already living in the apartment above theirs when, when they moved in. I'd just gotten out of the joint after doing a nickel for B&E. Breaking and entering for all of you non-criminal folk. And was trying to make go a go at a straight life. My probation officer found me a straight job working the graveyard shift for a minimum wage down at the Quick Mart convenience store. I usually passed her on the stairs in the mornings and I was headed home to bed and she was off to work the 7 to 4 at the coffee pot. Her husband, a hulking Pollock, who did odd jobs. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I forget that there's like other types of fucking racism. <laughs> who did odd jobs when he felt like it, spent most of the day laying around guzzling beer and watching game shows on the TV. By the time Mandy got home and got supper on the table, he was pretty well sloshed, and that was when the beatings would begin. He beat her mostly every night. She overcooked the meat that was worth a slap. She broke a dish, two slaps, forgot his beer. Well, she'll be limping for the next week. He was good too, rarely left bruises, unless he was really sloppy drunk. After the nightly beatings, he'd pass out on the couch in his skivvies and wife beater, snoring loudly and farting. That's when she'd slip out and head for the roof where she would sit and smoke, stare out at the city and wonder how long before he killed her. That's where we met. I often went up there myself for a little peace and quiet, a sanctuary from the noisy apartment building. It started with a polite conversation, talking about the local news, the weather, life in Fat City. Then we started sharing bits of our personal life until, every, until eventually we were sneaking back into my room for a little more privacy. And it wasn't long before it had become a full-fledged affair. I tried to talk her into leaving, but she was too afraid. 
She had tried to leave before and he'd almost killed her. Told her if she left again, he would kill her. We both knew it was inevitable that he'd find out about us. The building was just too small and the neighbors just couldn't keep from running their mouths. Mandy's visits were getting noticed and soon the information made its way back to her husband. I knew the jig was up when she came in from work and I heard him begin screaming immediately. He called her a whore, accused of running like a dog with that goddamn subhuman mick upstairs. At first, I could hear her... Oh, wait, everyone. At first, I could hear... No, I'm <laughs> I could hear her trying to fight back, arguing back that she was glad he knew. That she loved me and was leaving him and never coming back. That's when he started in with his fists. I could only stand listening to her cries and pleas for a few minutes before I was out the door and racing the... <laughs> Jesus Christ, I like... I like this, like, a cursed, like, almost good guy thing. <laughs> you said a few minutes. <laughs> like, like, think about that. Just like you hear, like, obvious abuse. Like, you know it's abuse. You're like, oh, okay, I'll wait a little bit. I don't want to, like, I don't want to cut in on their their, their interpersonal uh, problem-solving methods. <laughs> like, you, 30 seconds for me, then it's on site. Yeah, it depends what it is, because sometimes... Choosing words wisely here. Uh... Sometimes you don't know what's going on, but in this case, obviously, you know, he knows it's just domestic violence. I like the idea, though, if it's like 29 seconds and they stop, we're just like, okay, it's fine. Uh, anyway, back to after he was gone, we made, v wait, what? Breezy cried for a few minutes before I was out the door and racing down the steps. After he was gone, we made violent animal love in their teeny creaky bed. Exhausted, Mandy had fallen asleep while I stood at the window, smoking and wondering what my next play was until Mandy woke up and asked me, What do we do? I shrugged, stubbed my cigarette out in the ashtray and stood up. I'm going to take a piss, and then I have a plan, I said, and crossed the room to the bedroom. I mean, to the bathroom. I splashed a copious amount of hot, stinking urine into the rust porcelain bowl. So Why? <laughs> what is it? Wait, wrong one. I'm gonna take a piss, and then I have a plan. I crossed the room to the bathroom. I splashed a copious amount of hot, stinking urine into the rusty porcelain bowl, sighing as my bladder deflated. Ugh. Then I turned and looked at the body of her husband in the tub, the broken bottle still sticking out of his neck. I can't say it had been an accident. I could have taken him easy and left him alive. But some crimes just deserve the death penalty. And that's what I learned as a cop before going to jail for shaking down dealers and pimps for cash and drugs. Why is the toilet rusty? It's probably like bad water. I feel like the portion has like a little metal thing in there, right? The ru Yeah, that's kind of gross, actually. Well, not kind of. It definitely is gross. Um... Oh, so he's a good guy. Like, he got breaking and entering, but it was for doing it to bad people. You ever, you ever hear stories of that? Like, somebody's like, uh, they call the police. They're like, they stole my bag of weed somewhere where it's not legal. Like, they stole a pound of coke from me. And it's like, what are we supposed to do about it? Portion doesn't rust, man. That bitch is ceramic. I know it's ceramic, but, like, like you can get, like, yellow iron in your piss, dude. They're all, they all got iron in their piss. We got the, the iron pissers. I told her I had a plan, and if everything worked out, then soon there'd be no traces at all of Mr. Wife-Beating Drunkard here. I heard a knock at the door, and, ter and a terrified Mandy asking, Who's there? Who the fuck you expecting? Came the grovelled reply. Oh, who the fuck you expecting? Came the grovelled reply. I walked back into the room, slipped on my pants, and yelled out, Be there in a sec. Got my dick hanging out. Mandy looked at me confused. I made a call while you were asleep, okay? Told you I had a plan. I went to the door and unlatched the chain to let an old buddy of mine in. He was a monster of a man with dark olive skin and curly hair. His name was Pete Galleria, and he was connected to some of the top gangsters in town. We'd always gotten along, even when he was on the opposite sides of the law. He was mainly an enforcer for the Sharks, did a little hijacking, but was also known as a cleaner, a guy who could get rid of any bodies that might need to disappear. He lumbered into the room carrying a huge val valise. 
and shut the door behind him. What the fuck's a Valice? Pete Gonorrhea. Pete Gonorrhea, the guy that gets rid of bodies. Hold on, I'm gonna look up that. Valice? I don't think I've ever seen that. Oh, the bag. Hold on. Valise. 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 A small traveling bag or a suitcase. Bro, just say fucking suitcase. Okay? Just say suitcase. Shut the door behind him. Hey, Frankie boy, where's the stiff? He asked, his eyes darting about the room, still till landing appreciatively on Mandy. In here, I said, and led him to the bathroom. He studied the corpse in the tub for a few seconds, opened the bag, and pulled out a roll of heavy-duty trash bags and a huge serrated saw. How about making us some coffee? He said, how about making us some coffee? He said, and the cutting began. Feliz Navidad. Oh, that was the end. He's making pieces. Let's take a moment to not read. Let me put a... Bam. Oh! Yo, side note. I wanted you to hear this because you didn't hear it because Discord cut it out. It's broken. I'm over it. This is made in Thailand, dude. Nice blowing. Play the Naruto thing. Was that battle? I can't remember the name of this battle cry or whatever the hell. Fuck. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that got me too. <laughs> that freaked me the fuck out. I just need a minute here. Wake up call. So far, this one's pretty good. This is, I think this was a little bit better than the other one. The, the train ones. I think it's just because it's a continuous through, through line. Also, it seems like just one guy wrote all these. Yeah, Pulp City. So it's like a Pulp Fiction kind of thing, you know, just gritty. By Roger Cohen. So he's kind of, he's done a pretty good job tying everything together so far. So wake up. Oh. Did you guys play comp or did you play, um, not comp? The opposite of comp. Quick play. We got murder, sex, drugs, infidelity. It's about as gritty as it gets. It's pretty gritty. My new account can't play comp. Oh, wait, you actually started off a fresh one? Oh, shit. I still got to finish all mine. I'll probably... I'm not going to... Well, I'll do some of it this week. I'd probably pick, like, Saturday, Sunday to just grind them out a bunch. We're also farming a whole new account. Nice. Uh, I feel, I don't know, I'm feeling, when I play them, I feel more and more optimistic that I'm going to place way higher on the new one than I, well, can on my current one. Without just, like, straight up just doing, like, like, 400 IQ plays every single fucking game, or whatever. Like, I feel like that's the only way out on this current one, because some of these teams are conic. Give me a week with it, I'll place you in diamond. I don't want to get placed, I want to do the placement. <laughs> I want I want to do the placement so I know for myself. I don't want the higher one. That's what Shrek keeps joking about. He keeps saying he's like, he's just going to dump a, a GM one. He's just going to buy a GM account and give it to me and do like, play that. <laughs> then I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, dude. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm GM. What I am saying is, I mean, the content of that might be all right, but it probably wouldn't last long. I'd probably get it deranked pretty fucking quick. But, um, I was like, I just know I'm not fucking bronze. Like, it's just factually not bronze. Oh, and it's like way worse. I don't know, or no, I do know. It's it's just way worse to play around with that for extended periods of time, especially with the weird attitudes. It's the I think it's the combination of the bad communication and the bad attitude. They'll like type way more than anything else. I'm gonna be honest. I no longer know. 
how the fuck people have so many alts. What do you mean? Like, uh, why they have, like, how? Like, oh, you mean because of how much it takes to fucking unlock comp? Well, I think most of it's just, like, somebody like me. I could see somebody with my account selling this shit. The phone number thing and all. Yeah, I feel like I could see, like, selling this account because it's so, obviously, it's so locked at such a fucking low level that you could infinitely play on it and you could win a bunch of games and not go up. So, like, that's probably half of it. They just buy it and change the name. But also, once you've lost more than half, you just, you, whatever rank you are, you're locked in. It really feels like that's what the game does, is you're, whatever you win or lose, you're just locked there. And, you know what, part of it makes sense, because if you're a higher rank and you don't play any game, like, you play, like, say, like, say you're a normal person, and you don't play a hundred games a fucking week, or, or in my case, like, hundreds, if not thousands, <laughs> play, like, hundreds of games, you probably only play, like, maybe... Say it's like a few hours after work, um, if even that long, you're not gonna play that many games, so it's like rough. I just feel trolled though. I have to reframe the thinking though, to like go back to what I did for the bronze five shit to get out of that with the solo queue, where I would just like be super flexible. But I found that like not doing that, I've um, like going the other route, it feels like I dominate more, whether we win or not. Or dominate my thing, but there's like, like funny little stuff, like the the like the um the Kiriko plays and the BAP. I had a uh, aim the what the fuck correction thing on that I did not need on, and it was like fucking my shots up for like the last six months. <laughs> and I could have just not had it on, and I was I would have been fine. But the phone number thing, yeah. I, I, I like the idea of, like, some guy asking every single person in his family for their phone number so that they can make, like, eight accounts. It's a power move. We had a friend that did that exactly. That's wild. That's, like, unhinged. It's, like, unhinged and unnecessary. She had like five accounts. Why? That's too many. I, like if you're good, I feel like one or two is like good. I mean, technically I still got my mom's number and her her watch number I could use for two more alts. Damn. Like I get making the second one so that you can play whatever your friend's rank is. But I get, I, that's frustrating too. Cause like, I wonder how many of them are like throwing. Like you're in a game where you would win and they're like throwing on purpose so they can have this alt. And I'm just like, bro, there's a lot of people play with their friends. I think they already had that, though. You can just play with your friends. I made a joke that women should just make a Tinder account to get people's number to make accounts with them. <laughs> well, you have, to, you have to trust that they would, don't already have one. Make a catfish profile for this. Yeah, but you have to get the verification code, which probably would work because a lot of dudes would probably be like, well, I mean, I would. I don't play Overwatch, so I can give her the verification code. <laughs> Just a catfish, just to get gaming accounts. That's that is unhinged. That's too much. He's like, you don't need them that bad. Wait. Oh. Wait, does the background actually make any noise? I don't. Hold on. Properties. What about audio properties? All right, sir. I'm at the end of my rope. Oh, we're going to bed. Where the hell is... <laughs> Has it just been doing that the entire time? That's funny as shit. <laughs> I didn't realize... I forgot to mute that. That's funny as shit. Oh, hey, random guy. I'm wanting to try gaming, but my spam blocker isn't letting me get a code. Can I send it to you? That feels like a scam, doesn't it? 
like an actual scam. At the, I'm beyond tired, so I'll have a nice rest of the stream. I shall, we shall see each other at some other point. Rock and roll. Yo, I hope you have a good night. Thank, thank you for fucking hanging out, bro. Thank you. I'm gonna. I can't believe the other thing was just clicking the entire time, bro. Sleep tight. I shall continue the reading. I, I don't know. I've also heard of people using dating apps for just getting food, like dinner, which is like economically understandable, but I think that's like fucked up. <laughs> like, like, the London Kings. The London Kings blew into town and let it be known they had plans to control all of Fat City's rackets. Of course, nobody took them seriously. They figured the Kings were just talking shit. A bit of a braggadocio. Braggadocio? Bragged. Braggadocio. To bolster the reps. Hell, they weren't even a real gang. Or from London, for that matter. They were just three brothers from Liverpool named King, who had crossed the pond after making a name for themselves running guns for the IRA. Georgie was the eldest, in which he felt automatically elected him leader. But he was a bit too dull-witted to be the boss and was usually relegated to muscle. Tommy was the second oldest and the true leader. Smart and charismatic, he was the obvious choice to be the gang's public face. In private, he had a horrible temper and was the one who made the call on most of their murders. Back in Liverpool, he had once shot a 13-year-old girl in the face after he'd saw him removing his mask after a botched robbery. Harry was the youngest and worshipped his older siblings. Movie star handsome and a snappy dresser, a lot of unfortunate souls had written him as a harmless pretty boy. In truth, Prince Harry, as he was affectionately known by his brothers, was, a much, was as much a homicidal psychopath as the other two. Neff said he can get one last Lucio line. Payload's moving. Lucio's grooving. They started small, just nickel and dime stuff, strong armed robbery, a little dealing, some loan sharking, and of course, selling guns. They decided to set up shop in the Royal Arms at a small social club in the Heights that was owned by an Irishman named Billy Madigan, a former IRA soldier and a true believer in the cause. Unfortunately, the Royal Arms was also home base for Michael Weary's crew of Irish gangsters who ran most of the Heights criminal enterprises. The king settled the matter diplomatically enough by filling Michael Weary's body with enough lead to qualify him as a heavy metal. Madigan was quick to sell out the kings and head back to Belfast. A few months later, he blew himself into an Irish stew while building a bomb in his garage. Meanwhile, the kings brought over some of their old mates from Jolly Old and began expanding their base of operations. Nothing too drastic at first. They avoided stepping on the mob's toes and continued the Irish tradition of paying a percentage to the Ab Abadano crime family. Why did that go over your head? He meant the with flowers voice line. Nigga with the flowers. But he's lost now. He doesn't get it. Good night, sir. Nigga with the flowers. Uh, oh, in return, the Abadanos and other families left the kings alone offering them protection, sending them the occasional odd job. A hit here, a kidnapping there, another hit there. This was the way things stood for the next decade. But the kings not lost their, had not lost their ambition to be the biggest gang in town. And while they played nice with the mob, they also spent years building up relationships with politicians and the police and the unions. Abadanos didn't suspect the thing until Gino Abadano, the brother of Boss Carmine, wound up accidentally shot in the back of the head. The rumor was, Gino had paid a visit to Tommy to collect the mob's share of the king's prostitution business. An argument ensued when Gino accused Tommy of holding out on him. The argument ended, with Georgie, or ended when Georgie walked up behind Gino and pumped six bullets into his brain pan. The kings decided the time had come to announce their status with, with authority. They stripped Gino's body, cut off his genitals, shoved them in his mouth and dumped his body on Carmine's front yard. An open declaration of war, if there ever was one. The war that followed became legend in Fat City. Prince Harry was the first of the kings to fall to Carmine's wrath. 
Ignoring his brother's advice to keep a low profile, Harry was shot 64 times while coming out of his girlfriend's apartment building on West 94th Street. His body was ripped apart so bad that the M.E. had to use shovels to scrape up his remains. In retribution, the Kings blew up the monkey, the Blue Monkey Lounge thinking Carmine was in the club. Turned out Carmine was in, the th was in Sicily recruiting an army, and the only people killed were some regular citizens, a few low-level mob soldiers, and Carmine's beloved wife, Christina. When Carmine heard about Chrissy, he say he, to say he went ballistic would be an understatement of the century. His soldiers began scouring the city for Georgie and Tommy, cutting a swath through King's associates. The bodies piled up faster than shit through a goose. The streets of Fat City ran red with so much blood, even the usually natural, even the usually neutral police began to plead with Carmine to ease up. But Carmine couldn't be controlled. He had forgotten that none of this was personal. The Kings hadn't targeted Chrissy. They had wanted to take out Carmine, or as many of his lieutenants as they could. And they didn't give a damn about Carmine's wife. Carmine himself was the one to take a blowtorch and digsaw to Sid Pink, Georgie's best friend since childhood. Sid held out as long as he could, but when Carmine began to impromptu castration of him, Sid gave up Georgie's location. But when Carmine's men got to Georgie's hideout, they were too late. Georgie had been on his way to visit Sid when he saw Carmine's boys facing, forcing Sid into the back of their van. Old George wasted no time in collecting Tommy out of their hideout in the fashionable Omaha district and moving to a slightly more secretive but seedier Diggs town. Downtown. Sid's brutal mortar. Mortar. Sig's brutal mortar. Murder caused such a public outcry that the other families had no choice but to call Carmine in for a sit down. They tried reasoning with him first. Explaining the whole thing had been there had just been business that the Kings would play, but Carmine needed to be patient. All call a truce so everybody could get back to earning. When that failed, they resorted to threats, and when Carmine promised to go to war with all the families unless the Kings were handed over to him personally, the heads of the other four families could only sigh and agree that they could help Carmine find the brothers, but that uh, they would do it quietly, no big public hits or sensational murders. They would float the word Carmine had been forced to come to terms with the Kings, and that a meeting would be called between the Abadanos and the Kings. Everybody's safety would be guaranteed by Joey Ricky. Or is it Ricci? Is it Ricci? I don't know. Ricky? I'm going to go with Ricky. He was a close friend of the Kings and the head of the De Luca organization. Carmine agreed, and glasses of Armoretto were served as a toast. Moments later, Carmine was lying dead on the floor, his glass still clutched in his hand, the few remaining drops of amaretto dripping onto the carpet, its rich almond aroma disguising the scent of the cyanide that Joey had slipped into the drink. Upon hearing about Carmine's fatal heart attack, the kings decided it was safe to poke their heads out and make some conciliatory overtures to the family, other families. An arrangement was made that seemed to suit everybody and businesses returned to normal. Six months later, Georgie and Tommy were gunned down while coming out of the Royal Arms. No one took credit, but the rumors suggest it was an IRA hit. Yeah. Well, this is a big chunk of reading time. I will continue this. <clears throat> Well, I don't know. Maybe Friday. I will continue reading more. Um, <clears throat> I got a... I got a blue skidoo. Uh, what the hell? What time is it? 1 a.m.? It's kind of late, bro. But, I don't know. I'm going to go do some stuff. I hope everyone's good. Good night. <laughs>